Hi everyone, this is lecture 11.1. Uh, this time we will be talking about technology. So, uh, in this lecture we'll be talking about past technological advancements, uh, pre the use of technology today, and then what future technological advancements might look like in our immediate lifetimes. So, us humans, we use a lot of technology. We aren't the only ones to modify and create tools. Uh, chimps use some tools. Uh, birds have actually been found to use tools. But humans in particular, the way our brains work, the way we interact with our environment, we are all about using uh, tools and technology. Uh, this started with the hand axe, with, which was a basic caveman multi-purpose tool, right? Uh, there are various types of small tools that developed uh, as uh, we were really developing as a species. Then we had domesticated animals. Remember, so like cows and chickens, those are technology. They were bred for that purpose. Uh, animals are good for eating. They're good for travel. They're good for power to get a, a, uh, a field, plow, field plowed. And that goes right into the plow. Uh, the plow was great for growing more food, right? The, the agricultural revolution occurred about 4,000 years ago. And 4,000 years ago, we, not 4,000, 6,000, I'm sorry. 6,000 years ago, as a species, we skyrocketed because we were capable of growing more food faster. And therefore, uh, we weren't starving as a species anymore. And this allowed more people to do more things other than just farming. And that allowed for specialization, which then allowed for technological advancement. The assembly line was a massive piece of technological advancement. We were able to make more things for less money, right? Uh, we didn't have to, everyone in our society, dedicate part of their time to making clothes or uh, making all kinds of things from nails to tools to everything, right? We could just go to the store and buy it. That's what the assembly line did. Vaccines dramatically lowered death rates. And over the course of the 20th century, we were able to eradicate many diseases. Um, unfortunately, uh, we had a bit of a hiccup in the last uh, 10 to 15 years or so where some people stopped vaccinating their children. Hopefully, as a society, we've learned our lesson. I think so. And uh, that will we'll be able to do away with a little bit of that. Uh, but that's what that's about. And microchips. And microchips are crazy because pretty much every everything we consider technology in the modern world, the computer you're using right now, your iPod, your your Bluetooth, your your a lot of your car, these are microprocessors that were developed in uh, the 1940s. And what we recognize as microprocessors now wouldn't really uh, look anything like those did. But uh, they became capable of uh, really processing technology in really uh, an amazing way. Now, technology is not without its risks. There are certain bad things that have been done by technology. Uh, weapons were developed with tremendous capacity to take human life. And we really saw in the 1800s uh, warfare technology developed in a way that um, we became capable of humans of taking human life at such an efficient scale that uh, really became terrifying in the 20th century. So the Gatlin gun was first was the first automatic weapon developed and this was developed uh, during the American Civil War. The Gatling gun was used, quote, most effectively when fighting populations with less advanced military technologies. So uh, when the British were fighting the Zulu in Eastern Africa and in the United States during the uh, American Indian Wars, uh, these uh, technologies were used effectively to massacre um, in completely unfair fights uh, 50, maybe 100 people all the time, just, just blatantly murdering them. Um, and this technology of the Gatlin gun fundamentally changed what warfare was about, right? So 
really in the 1800s we saw the last of the you know two armies marching together kind of wars right that w and the civil war was really the last of those and we start seeing trench warfare develop uh during the first world war because they needed to develop a new strategy for the use of these gatlin guns well because people were hiding effectively in ditches with guns sitting up on the edge uh, this led to the use of advanced chemical weapons, uh, things like chlorine gas, things like mustard gas, which are really terrifyingly destructive and painful ways to die. So what they would do is they would lob a mustard gas canister up onto the next ditch over 50 feet away, and what it would effectively do is cause... Um, uh, mucus to build mucus and other body chemicals to fill up the lungs and you would effectively uh, drown in your own lungs really vile and pain horribly painful ways to die and this is what technology did to us uh, which was what made World War one such a really terrifying war um, and led to that war that was incredibly deadly and um, yeah, you want to read some grisly stuff. Check out World War One. So then, between the end of World War One and the end of World War II, uh, we developed new ways of doing warfare, right? We developed tank warfare in World War Two. We developed uh, air forces and air warfare and bombing raids. And at the end of World War II, we developed nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons, uh, especially uh, for our friends in uh, Los Alamos, here in University of New Mexico, we're aware of these things. Um, we developed uh, those technologies. And nuclear weapons were a major factor in creating the Cold War. If you aren't super aware, uh, Cold War was the period between 1950 and 1989 in which the United States and the Soviet Union, which is what we used to call Russia, threatened to go to war with each other over a variety of fronts. The nuclear, the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, these were weapons that could be used to destroy entire cities. In the bombing raids of World War II, Hundreds and thousands were bom of bombs were dropped on a city. At the end of World War II, it became possible that one bomb could destroy a city incredibly quickly. And one attack could destroy an entire country. Uh, luckily, in this world, we have not yet seen a full-on nuclear war. Um, may largely because the possibility of that could be... Um, that of total annihilation and this created an international climate in which uh, erratic leaders could cause tremendous damage incredibly quickly right uh, a lot of the leaders of the soviet union some leaders of the united states kind of unpredictable in what they would do and the unpredictability of those leaders created a great deal of fear in civilian populations so we th see things like that fallout shelter handbook that people would buy and propaganda produced by civilians and other literature, not just propaganda, produced by civilians where people were very, very, very concerned about what would happen if the United States went to war with the Soviet Union. Um, and, you know, there's concern now in our modern society of what would happen if we went to war with North Korea. And that would be very bad but it would be less of a risk than the the threat of the war than if we went to war with the soviets um it's i think it's kind of hard for people that didn't grow up during the cold war to really understand that overwhelming fear that was present but it was it was quite something and now um there are other risks of technology. So the combustion, th this isn't directly related to war, but the combustion engine that was invented in, 19, in 1794 
Uh, this allowed human populations to move away from rivers, from seas, from other sources of energy, right? It initiated the Industrial Revolution. It basically created the world around us. It made our lives much dramatically better. However, it created the conditions that would lead to climate change. Because combustion en engines release carbon via carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and it has the result of warming our atmosphere, and it has the result of uh, creating massive hurricanes. And, it, and all of this comes effectively only from using engines that that burn things most engines most energy burn things even if you're using batteries though that electricity probably got into that battery via burning something at some point and burning all that stuff is what is creating uh, the massive problems uh, for all of us it creates erratic weather here in Ohio it pro it creates incredibly hot hot dry summers for you in New Mexico um, it's impacting all of us it might impact us differently depending on where we are in the world but it impacts all of us uh, in highly unpleasant if not dangerous ways now not only has technology changed but our visions of technology have also changed, right? The Tomorrowland vision is not necessarily something we have of our future. We're not as optimistic as we used to be about the future. Uh, the children of the 1960s thought that they would grow up with rocket packs and cities on the moon and all of that. Um, and progress was once seen as being inevitable. And it was once seen that the world would be inherently better as we pushed forward in time. And that is very unfortunately something that we've lost in our society. I try to encourage people to still think that way because there are some incredibly interesting technological advancements that are going to be happening in the next 20 years or so. Um, but we have certain lost a certain optimism in that regard. So, when we talk about a society, when we talk about the society we live in, we have to talk about a concept known as technological determinism. This is the idea that the lives we live are highly dependent on the technology available to us. Um, you are not going to die of smallpox, tuberculosis, or polio in all likelihood. Uh, that is the result of vaccine technologies. I am teaching you from Ohio. I am sitting in my house in Ohio. You are probably sitting somewhere in New Mexico right now. Or you could be, you know, decide to take a vacation in the middle of class and go to Hawaii. And you know what? As long as you still do your coursework, go for it, right? And you can communicate with people all around the world, right? You can keep talking with your grandma even if she lives in Alaska. Uh, that's a big difference. That's a big difference. Postmodernist theorists contend that the defining quality of our society as it exists today is internet communications technologies. So the feature that makes your life different today from people in other societies, past and present, is the way we use this technology. Now, another thing that is of interest to sociologists is interactions that occur in co-presence. That's most of what sociologists study, is how does being in the same place at the same time as some other person, uh, what does that look like? Uh, and modern technology enables us to interact with people that are very far away. As I just said, already said, that's a redundancy, but online classes, this stuff we're doing right now, would not be possible without um, our ability to be an online co-presence. Now, culture lag uh, these and cultural diffusion, these are other concepts that have to do with technology. Culture lag is the time between changes in material culture or online technology 
and the resulting changes in broader cultures, relevant norms, values, meanings, and laws. What does that mean? That is the time in between we have a new technology and we know how to use it ethically. So, um, for example, uh, social media has a big problem with culture lag. There are some people um, that never really got the message that you're not supposed to just put things on social media that aren't, um, you know, super, super personal, like talking about how much you drink over the weekend or your relationships or how much you hate this one person, right? Uh, these are our hot messes. Uh, these are the, the Facebook friends that we follow, but only because you don't know what they're going to say next. They never got the message from the rest of society that you don't overshare like that right and why didn't they get that message because their grandparents are at church or wherever they learned their uh, traditional teachings wherever they got their their learning their social learning didn't teach them that stuff about technology because it doesn't say in our Bibles or in our holy scriptures or whatever that were written thousands of years ago hey don't show topless pictures of yourself online, right? That's not in there because that te that te that wasn't something that Moses thought of, right? Um, that is culture lag, right? That not knowing how to responsibly use technology. Cultural diffusion then is the spread of material and non-material culture to new cultural groups, regardless of the movement of people. So. Uh, and there's a lot of cultural diffusion that happens uh, in the area where you live in New Mexico. There is a heavy interplay between more American Anglo type cultures and more uh, Latin American Hispanic type cultures, which is really, really interesting. Um, so you are like in the bed of cultural diffusion, but that same like exchange of cultures right there um, also makes it so that we have Taco Bells in Maine, the state of Maine, right? There are very few Latino people in the state of Maine. It's overwhelmingly white. But because American culture is seeping up uh, the Latino culture uh, in your area, and then they tell people, you know, they, someone calls someone up on the phone about it and say, yeah, you got to check out this food. Oh, I got a Taco Bell over here, right? And they get the idea for a Taco Bell, right? It's not Mexican food, it certainly isn't, but it's inspired by Mexican food, and that creates a certain cultural diffusion. Uh, there is a conversation to be had about cultural appropriation versus cultural diffusion. Uh, cultural appropriation being um, a dominant culture, taking things from a uh, subordinate culture. Uh, and I think really the major distinction there is respect. Uh, and we should be aware of it. If, if we are using a component from another culture, eating a food or decorating our house with it, we should at least really know what it is if it's not part of our genuine culture. Because if we aren't, it goes beyond being cultural diffusion. It does go into be uh, cultural appropriation. It goes on to being something less than respectful. So... Our present views of the future have darkened, as I touched on a moment ago. We don't really see the future as that of the Jetsons or that of space people that much. We really don't think that way. We think of it more in terms of post-apocalyptic societies, of the fact that, you know, we are going to be scrabbling to live terrible, uh, short lives in the future uh, and our vision of the future is often post-apocalyptic it's also often very dark um, and and I'm not sure that I'm not sure if that functions for society I'm not it's it's troubling to me it's something I worry about because I want to live in that future society and unless we work toward it we won't get there so, but the question is, will technology doom or will technology save us? We are living in a time of astounding technology. 
Many of the things we do today would be absolutely unimaginable in the 1960s. Not just our online class, but the ways that we do online classes wouldn't be even conceivable then. And the new technology that's being developed today and what we're going to be doing in 10 or 20 years, even just 10 years, are almost inconceivable to us today. For example, we are developing artificial neural networks, which will be the next generation of artificial intelligences that will be able to help us compute problems and solve problems in a way that we hadn't been able to in the past. We'll be able to, if we apply these properly, stop things like food shortages. We may be able to fix climate change with this stuff, right? Yes, and it's scary. An artificial neural network, artificial intelligence, might become conscious, right? And what do we do with conscious computers? Mmm. Are they going to murder us all? That's the question, isn't it? Um, but, but try to look past, are they going to murder us all? How are they going to help us, right? Try to change your mindset in that way. Because they're going to come, right? We don't really have a choice in that. But we do have a choice in, I guess, our perspective in them, right? Uh, be, sh be sure to say please when you ask Alexa for something because she might remember it in about 10 years. Additionally, Hyperloop technology. I don't know if you've heard about this stuff. I th find it incredibly interesting, mainly because it's going to be impacting me and it might impact you. I think they are developing them in your part of the world. But they're developing this thing called a Hyperloop train that um, it's expected in the next 15 to 20 years will be linking cities. Uh, there's one set to be linking uh, the city of Columbus with Pittsburgh and with Chicago. And it will make it so that we can travel between Columbus and Chicago in about 30 minutes. That's an eight-hour drive. Imagine doing that in 30 minutes in a train, right? Uh, and it's expected, it's hoped, that it will be pretty inexpensive. So it would be less than like a plane ticket. And it would be common. And if they do it right, it will effectively make those three cities spread over space it will effectively make them one city, right? So you would be able to live in Pittsburgh and go visit your cousin in Chicago and be back by nighttime, right? Or you could live in Columbus and commute to work in Chicago because a lot of people commute farther than 30 minutes, don't they? Uh, really, really amazing stuff that... Um, if the hyperloops go into play, and you might do a little Google searching on that, it could literally change everything. And as I emphasize, the role of vision is, is critical. Um, and we need to ask ourselves, is it possible to advance society without a guiding vision? And if we remain pessimistic the way we are, if we think that the future is going to be all doom and gloom and, and death, Will it be possible for us to advance? Because with that kind of pessimistic outlook, I'm not sure. And is it possible to save ourselves without everyone agreeing? That is another major problem. Are we doomed to argue over the solutions of climate change until everyone agrees and that it won't happen? Is it possible to do things without convincing 100% of the population that actually, yeah, climate change exists? Uh, is it already too late? Um, or can our friends, the big computers, help us to fix it? These are the questions, right? And these are the questions we will be discussing in our discussion boards. And I look forward to that. Uh, talk to you later.